Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? All right, well, my name's Derek. If I haven't met you yet, welcome to Lake Springs Church. I'm one of the pastors here at Lake Springs, and we're super glad to have you hanging out with us today. Uh, We are in week three of a series on the spiritual practice of generosity, and hopefully, if you've been here for the last couple weeks, you've begun to start somewhere as we discussed in week one, because we know that God owns it all, that, that he uh, has it all, and we are just his stewards and his caretakers. But also, hopefully this past week, you were able to identify maybe some places in your spending habits where you spent on things that you don't necessarily need, and you can maybe uh, live a little bit more simply and use that portion of the resources in which God has entrusted you to be generous, because because God and Jesus really want us to be careful and be on guard and watch out for all kinds of greed. You know, uh, as we've discussed in the series, over 25% or around 25% of Jesus' teachings deal with the idea of money. And um, they're, I don't know, like, they're, they're pretty radical, right? Like, I mean, like in our world, in, in the way in which like, we engage in our world, like they're, they're pretty radical teachings in a world that, that, for lack of a better term, idolizes success and money and the pursuit of happiness, coupled with freedom that basically says, no one gets to tell me what to do, right? So when you hear the words of Jesus, things kind of get a little bit crazy, But as a follower of Jesus, we have to come to this place where we're willing to give Jesus and God full control over our lives, which is more easily said than done. Yet, it is something that we must consciously and and like ultimately choose each day to say, you know what, God, I'm yours. All that I am, all that I have is yours because the teachings aren't going to become any less radical. And it's not just about money that Jesus teaches radical things. He teaches radical things all the time. He says things like, the first will be last and the last will be first. I don't know how that works, but it works in Jesus' teaching. He says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. He says things like, bless those who persecute you and pray for your enemies. The radical teachings of Jesus are always there, constantly confronting our beliefs, our feelings, our actions, and trying to get us to see things with different eyes and with a different perspective. But one of the most radical things Jesus has ever said is that it is more blessed to give than to receive. This word blessing or blessed here in the Greek is the word uh, makarios, and it means happy or fortunate or well off. And so it can be translated in a number of different ways. One of the ways that it's been translated is there is more happiness in giving than receiving. The message says it this way, you're far happier giving than getting. So you get the point, right? Right? Richard Foster, one of my favorite writers of spiritual disciplines and spiritual practices, says, the unreasoned boast abounds that the good life is found in accumulation. That is, more is better. Indeed, we often accept the notion or this notion without question with the result that the lust for affluence in contemporary society has become psychotic. It has completely lost touch with reality. We talked about this last week, how money is a liar, how in our world we find that most people believe that the more you have, the happier you're going to be, but that's just simply not true, right? It doesn't align with reality. It's psychotic. (laughs) Even the social scientists would even agree with Jesus on this one. Studies have shown that people who give the most actually are happier, healthier, less depressed, less anxious, take an interest in their own personal growth, have better relationships, live longer, and laugh more. Don't you guys want to laugh more? (laughs) 
And this is true across every socioeconomic demographic. I mean, it is, it is true about race. It's true about gender. You name it, it's true. The Journal of per- Personal and Social Psychology says that it is a, a, a feature of generosity that is a universal feature of human psychology. So this is true across the board no matter who we ask. The sociologists Hillary Davidson and Christian Smith in their book, The Paradox of Generosity, conclude this way. People rightly say that money cannot buy happiness, but money and happiness are still related in a curious way. Happiness can be the result, not of spending more money on oneself, but rather of giving money away to others. The data examined here show this to be not simply a nice idea, but a social scientific fact. So Jesus was right. Surprise, surprise, right? (laughs) More generosity equals more happiness. Now, let me make a quick disclaimer here. Because there, are, all, there are, are many ways in which you can be generous. There's so many ways in which you can be generous. You can be generous with your time, your gifting, relationships, influence, information, and so many other things, including money. And we're choosing to use money as the prime example during this series because although generosity has a lot more to do with other things than just money, it is not less than dealing with money. It is a big part of it. In fact, it's the primary way in which Jesus talked about generosity, and we see generosity talked about in the scripture, and it's also a primary struggle that we have as human beings. So with that, we're going to open up our Bibles to Luke, or Matthew chapter 6, all right, Matthew chapter 6, and if you uh, don't have a Bible, there should be one in the seats in front of you, and you can find the page number there. It's 787, so you can grab the Bible, turn to page 787, and we'll be uh, in Luke, in, in Matthew chapter 6. I don't know why I want to keep saying Luke, um, but, but maybe that's because my Bible is marked in Luke. I don't know. Um, maybe that's just because that's where I've been reading lately. Uh, but, but we're in Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6, uh, and we're going to start in verse 19, all right? Jesus says these words. <clears throat> He says, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, Jesus makes uh, this famous statement of store up treasure in heaven. And this idea in the ancient Hebrew uh, world was this way of saying, like, like, put all that you have, all that you are in God, because he's your only eternal hope. I don't know about you. Uh, anyone in here moved a lot? Let me see a show of hands if you've moved around a good bit in your life. Okay, yeah, so I've moved a lot. Uh, some, some would say more than is healthy uh, for a human being. But, um, but I can think, man, like every time we move, how much stuff we throw away just boggles my mind. Like it is absolutely insane how much stuff just gets thrown in the trash whenever you move. But even more baffling to me than that is the fact that every time I move, I end up coming in touch with a box that has not been opened and has not been touched since the last time I moved. You guys ever have this experience? Um, I, don't know, I don't know why, but when I come in touch with that box and I open it up and I see what's actually in it, I'm like, you know what? I kind of don't want to get rid of any of this stuff. <laughs> I don't know how many years it's been since I've used it, but I don't want to get rid of it because who knows, you know? It's one of those things that you just kind of get into this mindset of, of holding on to things that you don't even really use. And that just fade away and deteriorate over time. You know, I heard a story of a guy who was an avid reader 
even from the time that he was a young boy. But he got married, and him and his wife, they were moving uh, houses. And so he went to the garage to go pick up the box of Hardy Boys books that he grew up reading as a child. And when he picked up the book, or the box, to put it in the truck to take it to their new house, the bottom of the box fell out, and the books disintegrated and just into dust on the ground. Because they had just been eaten away by vermin. And this is exactly what Jesus is teaching. He's saying the longer and longer and longer you store up stuff for yourself here on earth, it's just going to fade over time. It's not going to last. It's not going to go with you when you leave this place. So put your hope in something else. Put your hope in something eternal, like the kingdom of God. And Jesus, he's saying, don't work so hard to hold on to stuff that really is just going to fade away when it's all said and done. But don't we do that a lot? Don't we work and strive and aim to take hold of things that just are going to fade over time? But this isn't the thing that Jesus is most concerned about. He says this because he's most concerned about your heart. That's why he says it. See, his issue really is that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, we may think that this means that where you put your money um, is where your heart already is. And that's true. Right? Like, I mean, there is a, there is a fact to that, right? When you, when you have children or, or when you have a nice house or when you drive nice cars, like, you value those things. Those things are important to you, and so you're willing to spend more money on them. So there is a sense of where your money follows your heart. But I think what Jesus is also saying here is that your, your uh, heart follows your money, <laughs> Right? I, I think about this every time I get a new car, how quickly my heart is driven to that car, right? Uh, because I've just spent a lot of money on it when my child decides they're going to bring pretzels into that car, I very quickly get frustrated and upset, right? Like, because this is, is this, this moment where like I, my heart is now, because I've spent a lot of money on something, my heart is in it, right? But if that's true about a car, then it's definitely true about the kingdom of God. That if we would invest in the kingdom of God, we start putting our our money and our resources into the kingdom of God, how much more is our heart and our care and our concern going to be for the kingdom? I like to think that uh, people who give to the church really care what we do with their money, (laughs) right? Because they're invested here enough to do that. People who don't really give to the church, they don't really care how we spend the money. (laughs) Because their heart really isn't tied to this place. I just want you to know, like I don't I don't really think that like our church really needs your money. And God is gonna take care of us. I really believe that, no matter what. But here's what I do believe is that. Uh, we want your heart and God wants your heart and he can't have your heart if he doesn't have your money. And so there's a part of that that we all have to understand. That's what Jesus is really getting at. So, so yeah, your money follows your heart at times, but Jesus is also making it clear that your heart also will follow your money. So investing in the kingdom, investing in something that's going to last forever, long after you're gone, matters if you're following Jesus. But one of my favorite things Jesus ever says actually comes in verse 22. So let's look at that. It says this. It says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? You may find it weird that Jesus starts talking about eyes in the midst of a teaching on money. Anyone else find that odd? But here's the deal. Whenever Jesus is saying this, he's speaking culturally about the way that people thought about the eye. 
See, the eye was a way or a, or a picture of, of how you viewed the world, how you looked at the world, meaning that if you saw the world as God saw the world, your eye was good and it was healthy and it was full of light. But if, you're, if you saw the world in a different way than God sees the world, then, then your, your eyes were bad and your life was full of darkness. In this teaching, to have a healthy eye actually implies generosity. If you look at your NIV, it, the NIV actually puts a footnote there that denotes that, that, that this, this healthy eye, it actually implies generosity. So saying that if you can see what God sees, you'll never miss the poor. You'll never miss the needy. You'll never miss an opportunity to be generous whenever you have a chance because you can see what God sees and you see what most matters and what most needs to be invested in and so your eye is good and your eye is healthy and your life is full of light and to have an unhealthy eye meant that you were stingy it meant that you didn't see the world the way God sees the world you saw the world in a very different way you might think that God is capable of blessing you with more but you didn't really trust him to bless you with more and so you just hold on to it all for yourself and if you have that mindset, then, then you have an unhealthy eye, and you have a, a darkness living in you that is very, very great. This has become to be known in our world as the difference between the abundance mindset and the scarcity mindset. You guys heard those terms? If you have an abundance mindset, you see, man, God owns it all. He created it all. He has more than enough to take care of you. Therefore, I can be free and be generous on every occasion, storing up my treasure in God, and I have a healthy eye. But if I have a scarcity mindset, then I'm trapped by this feeling of always consistently and constantly battling for resources and being consumed with fear of never having enough or greed that is always pushing for more than you actually need. And so you become less generous and less able to give and you don't see the world the way God sees the world and you miss opportunities because you're storing up treasure for yourself here on earth and you have an unhealthy eye. See, Jesus is a brilliant preacher, way better than me. And... <laughs> And I just love these riddles. They're so, so insightful. And this is one of my favorites. But he doesn't finish there. He finishes in verse 24 where he says this. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, I want you to just think about this. Jesus says you can't serve two masters. This is pretty true, right? I mean, just think about it. For just a few seconds, you begin to realize if you were a soldier in the military, and let's say you had two commanding officers, and one's telling you to fire, and one's telling you not to fire, who do you listen to? You have to make a choice, don't you? It's up to you. You have to choose. But if you choose, the one you don't listen to is going to be pretty upset, it's going to be pretty upset about the fact that you just disobeyed a direct order. Think about this in the workforce, right? You're in the marketplace and you have two jobs. And, and both of your jobs want you to show up on Monday morning at 8 a.m. That's a problem, right? And you have to make a choice. You have to say, you know what? Uh, I, you have to tell one of them, hey, I can't be there because I have this other job. And then what's that other one going to say to you? Well, maybe you should just do that other job, right? Because I, I need to be here today. What, it, so so you, it, it, there's, this, there's this conflict that happens when you try and serve two masters and when you try and serve two different groups of people. And that's what Jesus is teaching. He's saying it's like that with money. Now, the translation committee of most of our translations chose to uh, translate that last word as money, but Matthew actually leaves it untranslated in the original Greek. So he doesn't translate it into Greek from Jesus' native Aramaic. He actually leaves it what Jesus said it was, which was the word mammon. 
Mammon was a foreign god of wealth. So he literally is saying that you cannot serve God while also trying to serve Mammon, this other god, this god of wealth. It is a fact that God has always seen a part of our human experience, the fact that we are going to have a tendency to worship created things instead of the creator. That we're going to worship other things that we should, we should um, push back and not idolize. This is why he says, don't worship any other gods before me. Don't make any graven image. These are the first two commandments. Because he knows, like, you're going to be prone to do this, human beings. And we want to do this with money. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, many of you will turn money into a God and worship it. And give your devotion and your love and your life to it. You can't serve God and mammon. So, when Jesus finishes up and he's just... These few verses, I mean, it's like five or six verses here. He's already taught us on three levels, coming after the core of who we are. And the first place that he goes after is our hearts. Now, Billy Graham once said, he said, if a person gets his attitude with money straight, it will straighten out every and almost every other part of his life. Jesus is basically making the same point that if our hearts are good and we understand how money is connected to our hearts and we can get that right, most everything else will go pretty well. Another way of thinking about this is if you're following Jesus, that should be a, that should be a relationship that changes you. If you're following Jesus, your heart should change. And especially around certain things like money, your heart should change. The way you look at it, the way you view it, the way you engage with it, the way you use it, it should all change because you're now following Jesus. And so just by following him, your heart changes. And that changes the way in which you use money you see Jesus isn't really saying that generosity is about a behavior or about an act but it really it's about the inner condition of your heart generosity is about what's within and that leads to the second thing that Jesus is talking about which is what we do with it on the outside with our hands and he engages us in the practice of generosity You see, generosity is bigger than a tithe or larger than a one-time radical gift of radical generosity. If you're following Jesus, generosity should be a way of life. He says, store up treasure in heaven. That's like a long game thing, you know? It's not like a, hey, I gave to the church this year, or hey, I, I gave to this nonprofit this year, or hey, I, I, I gave this big gift to this this special fund or this special opportunity, this special missions thing. Like it, it, it's a practice of ongoing generosity, of storing up treasure in God and in the kingdom. And all the research that I mentioned earlier about how people find more happiness and how they find more joy in their life, none of that is founded uh, of people who give one-time generous gifts That's not the pathway to the joy and the happiness that Jesus is talking about. The pathway is consistently practicing giving again and again and again, storing up treasure in God because you know he will provide all that you need. And it gives you this sense of more contentment over longer periods of time with less worry and anxiety and fear and everything else. And so it's a, it's a practice with our hands that we keep giving and keep giving and keep giving. But then he also engages us in what I'm going to call our head. By looking at our mindset and our worldview and calling that into question. 
that he says, man, I have to ask ourselves in light of Jesus' teaching, do I truly see the world the way he sees the world? Do I see that he owns it all and, and he has it all and he's had it all since the beginning? That this is the truth woven throughout scripture and I cannot deny it. And it ultimately finds all of its hope in Jesus and the gospel because the Father gives the Son. And the Son gives his life. And the Father and the, the Son give us the Holy Spirit for our help. Forgiveness and grace to all those who believe in Jesus that he loved them and that he died for them and he gave them eternal life. It's an act of giving. Forgiveness, the expression of forgiveness is an act of giving from our generous God who gives us something we haven't earned and that we don't deserve. And when we give, we, we begin to live and see the world as he sees the world, as an opportunity to give more of ourselves away, to die to our own passions and desires and, and truly give for the kingdom and his glory and its power forever to come here on earth as it is in heaven. So he challenges us can you see what I see? Do you have the eyes that I have? Are your eyes healthy? Or are they unhealthy? Is your life full of light or is it full of darkness? And if it's in darkness, he says, come to me. Come to me. Trust me. Let me show you how to walk through this life. And he'll begin to change our hearts so that we can be more gracious and more generous, just like him. So who doesn't want to be more generous? I mean, after all, right, there's always more joy in giving than receiving. So here's what I want to challenge you to this week. I want to challenge you that as you kind of set your sights on taking some next steps in your generosity, make a plan. Make a plan to be consistently generous. The first week I told you, start somewhere, right? That might be like, oh, I see somebody in need. I'm going to give them 10 bucks, or I'm going to give them a meal, or I'm going to do something for them special. Like, like start somewhere. But, but now I want you to really sit down. I want you to try and make a plan to be consistently generous, and then actually begin executing that plan and that can be in a number of different places but but I think the, the heart is that God wants you to see what he sees and be generous and gracious like he is generous and gracious and the more and more and more you do that in a consistent fashion the more and more you'll see he's always providing and he's always there and he Whenever you are getting scared because the bank account gets below a certain number, he's never worried. He's never concerned because he's the God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And he can do abundantly more than you could ever imagine in your life and through your life and through your generosity. So make a plan, be consistently generous, Start executing that plan. And if we can help in any way, please let us know. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you because you are such a good God who loves us. And God, all of this finds its home in the truth that you have given us life. That you breathe life into the dust causing our hearts to beat our blood to pump through our veins 
you gave us that life. You give it to us again and again each day. God, you have given us eternal life through the Son who gave his life, through the Father who gave his Son, so that we might be able to experience the power of your Spirit in which you give to us as a stamp of your approval and of, uh, of the fact that you have bought us and call us your children. You just give and give and give. God, help us to be more like you. To love more like you. To give more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.